Good evening, everyone. Woo! Welcome to Club 57 at the Museum of Modern Art. My name is Regenda Roy. I'm the chief curator of the Department of Film here at the museum. Um, and for the past few months and for the few months to come, thanks to my incredible colleagues, Ron Magliozzi and Sophie Cavalacos, the curators of Club 57, I am also part of a celebration of New York, of the East Village in the late 70s, early 80s, and the culture that was created through the club scene downtown. And to be able to bring that um, to Midtown is a joy, because at one point I did the same thing. I brought myself from the East Village to Midtown and go, hey, uh, we can do this, we can make Midtown cool. So here we are, thank you all for bringing it. Um, so if there was a better example of artists who brought the energy that emerged out of Club 57. Um, there probably isn't a better example than Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman and the amazing, the amazing musical productions um, that they created with cohorts. Um, they initially took root in the basement at the club of 57 St. Mark's Place and then blossomed all over the village at places like the Pyramid, Limelight, The Saint, The Palladium, to name only a few. Tonight's flashback to this unique moment in New York City's community theater history is thanks to the generous and seemingly tireless Shaman and Whitman themselves, who have taken time out of their busy Broadway and Hollywood schedules to bring the scene back to us. And they will do that with the help of three longtime friends from those legendary club stages, Michael Musto, Laura Kenyon, and Annie Golden. You will also get to experience one young star in the making, Jake Ryan Flynn, and on sax, Aaron Hike. So, Imagine it's the early 80s, you're seated in the East Village with a gang of neighborhood friends who are about to come out and put on a show. But first, please welcome someone who must have been a toddler at the era, Michael Musto. Thank you. I was actually 50. I'm actually 50, <laughs> and I've taken time tonight out of my busy schedule at the Broadway gift shop and the Hollywood diner. But this crowd tonight, first of all, is amazing. It's almost like a night at Club 57, but we're moving uptown, aren't we? And I'm amazed to see and hear tourists, you know, a lot of them are tourists, uh, looking at the exhibit and going, Club 57, Club 57, and we're like, wait a minute. This was basically the basement of a church on St. Mark's Place. It was a total dump. <laughs> But magic was made there, and I cannot believe, and I'm amazed, that it's being commemorated so many years later. Thank you for being part of it. Now, of course, integral to that scene, uh, way before they made a Mary Poppins movie, before they brought you uh, Smash, Hairspray, and so many other things, were the gay Rodgers and Hammerstein, Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman. Now, guys, first, the obvious question, which you told me to ask, how did you two meet? Well, we, we met in a very sort of MGM cute way, like in an MGM musical. Um, I, was, uh, I was working with a group um, uh, doing an act at the duplex, and, um, uh, and this is like 1976. So uh, it was the year of the tall ships, Legionnaire's disease, son of Sam, and Mark Shaman. That's when I met Mark Shaman. <laughs> <laughs> four plagues. Um, the four plagues. So uh, I, I was doing a show upstairs at the duplex, and meanwhile downstairs, the, real, du the, the real duplex, the original duplex, when it was on Grove Street, and downstairs in Marie's Crisis was uh, your turn to take okay. over. I was um, I was just sixteen, 
I was only 16. Um, and I was, and ironically went, uh, came from New Jersey with a friend to go see the musical Boy Meets Boy at the Actors Playhouse. Little did I know how prophetic it was because we ran into some other people from New Jersey on the corner there of Grove and 7th Avenue. So they said, and it was still like 4.30. So they said, well, let's go in this place right here. And it was Marie's Crisis Piano Bar. Uh, so there was no one else in it, and I shouldn't in have been daytime, in there. In the daytime, in the daytime. Yeah. <laughs> but especially because I was 16, I was like, oh, my God, a piano. So I started playing the piano, and the bartender, just like out of a movie, like, stopped sweeping, sweeping and said, hey, kid, you're good. Wait right here. And he went next door. He says, I've, I know some people who need a funny piano player. And then suddenly in walked Scott and Lisa and... Our friend Tracy, Tracy. and I said to him... Uh, there, Lisa, Tracy, they're here. And I said, I said to, can you play and Mary? And Mary, right? And I said to Mark. All right, already. <laughs> <laughs> I said, can you play together like at a bar mitzvah? Well, no, that, no, you said, can you play cheesy? A cheesy. And I had, I had never known anyone with that sense of humor. I would do it at cast parties to, to you know, tepid response. But, you know, usually. But go. I said, you mean like. I said, that's our Hitler. <laughs> the piano's awful boomy. So before Grinder, there was Marie's Crisis. Yeah. yeah. And there's still Marie's Crisis. Now, let's move on to another club, which is Club 57. What brought you two guys to that place? Okay, well, we, we were... Um, first of all, it was New York in the, in the late 70s, which was broke, uh, scary... Uh, you would literally step over bodies, and you would run down blocks, to, hoping you wouldn't get killed. It was and fabulous. And now, now, now we're now we're in New York in our seventies, broke, scary. <laughs> At least this audience is. I got to tell you, my God. And we look back on well, weren't those the good old days when you needed like a, a tank to get through the East yeah, Village? Yeah. Right. I was telling our, our young actor in the show what it used to be like to go down 42nd Street. Like you'd stand on 8th Avenue, and you'd look towards 7th Avenue and you'd be like, "Okay, here I go." <laughs> it was so scary. So we we need we were doing like cabaret acts. I was I was working. We were both working with a group called the High Heel Women, and I wanted to start. Yeah. I, I wanted to start. It was like a, a lesbian Marx Brothers. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> Only not lesbian. But um, so I, uh, one of them of was. But I, anyway, so I, uh, I wanted to direct uh, shows. And so um, I had a friend who was a stand up comedian who's now no longer named Marjorie Gross. And she said, <laughs> she had said, I know this place. You should come down and see it. And it was. Um, uh, on, on 57 St. Mark's Place, the basement of the church. And uh, I went down there, and I think the show I saw there, the night I went, was the St. Joan Bake Off, it was called. And it was people doing uh, speeches from different versions of, of St. Joan. I, I, it didn't make any sense. So, uh, and I said, oh, this is perfect. This would be great for us. So I, I, I asked the person there at the time who was managing it, a really fantastic guy and a great, great director, also no longer with us, named Andy Reese. And I, yeah. And I asked Andy, could, could I do a show here? And he said, sure, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'd really love to do dinner theater. So, um, so I, he said, sure, and he put me on the calendar. And um, I said, I want to do the worst play ever written. And he says, what's that? I said, it's called Boeing, Boeing. <laughs> Which was based on a, it was a French playwright. Yeah. It flopped on Broadway. It was a movie with Jerry Lewis. Uh, yeah, and Dean. And, and, and many Tony years Curtis. later, won a Tony Award for Mark Rylance. Yeah, and, yeah 30, years, five, 30 years later, they did it on Broadway. We were 30 years ahead of our time. So... Um, and you gave dinner. And, yeah, we gave dinner. I wouldn't tell you what was in that dinner. It was uh, macaroni and cheese. And acid. And Scott Covert, <laughs> Scott Covert, who was in the play at that time, was working as a courier, of all things. And, and he would bring back um, blankets and, uh, you know, the, the pillows from the, you know, what are the uh, life preservers. Right. 
and he ox for oxygen things, and he would bring them back, and I said, "We'll use those in the play too." So and, um, and Tracy Berg was obsessed, and probably still is, with Joan Rivers. Yes, right. So how did Joan Rivers fit into well, Boeing Boeing? Explain. I was worried that people wouldn't know all their lines. So Tracy would sit in the front as Joan Rivers like she was directing it. <laughs> but um, she also got to sing a song that, that uh, we wrote for the occasion. Would you like to chair? Sure. Although I bet Tracy would like to sing it more than me. But I'm going to sing it. Yeah, no, no, sure. But sing along when we sing get to along, the, the, Tracy, the bridge, please. Seat. Everyone who, who knows it. All four of you. <laughs> she walks down the street at 12,000 feet high above the others. I'm telling you, if you take to the skies when you look in her eyes, then you're going Boeing. Just look how she swings when she spreads her wings high above the runway. Your altitude will rise. Hey, up to the skies, brother, you'll be going. Boeing on, Boeing, Boeing, first class or standby, she's the one to land by, Boeing, Boeing, life can be a breeze high above the trees, and listen Mr. Wright, look up tonight and you'll see a sight that'll set you soaring, I'll be up there with my three steward die, brother will be going. You married? Yeah. It's crazy because look at the look how the nerve I have to do it twice in one night. With the same dinner. With the same dinner. It was not even heated up. But uh But it was basically a door slamming for us about flight attendants back when flight attendants were funny. And we didn't have any doors, so that made it even more complicated. Um, now let's move on to the next one. Wait, wait I, I just, there's one more thing about that. Oh, there's a great, uh, first of all, that's a fabulous uh, uh, flyer that Andy Reese did for it, but there was the program. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Ula Hedwig was kind of the Shirley MacLaine there as yeah, a yeah. last minute replacement. Uh, I don't know who she replaced. I can't even read Bambi. Wait, she is goes, Ula here? Ursula. Yes, Ula's here. <laughs> Ula, give us your, your famous line. <laughs> okay, then you did a show called Living Dolls. Which, no, no, Trojan Wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Trojan uh, Women, which was very far from Euripides. Yeah, so then uh, we decided that we needed to add something classical to the repertoire. So, um, uh, so we did, uh, we did uh, the Trojan Women or No Royalties for Euripides. But it was right around the time that the MGM had a huge fire. They had a fire at the MGM Grand in, in Las Vegas. So I said, oh, well, let's set it in the ruins of that. And so, I think I have the flyer here. Whoops. Go. Uh, here we go. So that's a brilliant, uh, uh, Vicky Schrott did that. And look, ladies and gentlemen, it cost five dollars to get in. <laughs> um, My so name is misspelled. Your name's misspelled. It's always. <laughs> so Tracy again uh, reprised her role as Joan Rivers. Uh, Laura Kenyon played Lainey Kazan, um, and. Uh, but Lainey Kazan as Hecuba. Yeah, no, and, and Tracy. Wait, Tracy, Tracy was, was Joan Rivers as Hecuba, right. <laughs> and Laura as Lainey Kazan, Kazan playing uh, 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 Andromaca. Andromaca, and I played her infant piano playing son, Astonax, who was forced to suckle <laughs> at her breast, and I believe also her crotch. Yeah, yeah. This Feed is me. what Scott would make me do. Yeah. And there were still jaded audience members going, this has been done. <laughs> <laughs> but the crazy thing that happened was that it got a really good, there was only one newspaper back then that, that really um, you know, uh, spoke of the times down there, and it was the Soho Weekly News. And it got a rave review in the Soho Weekly News. So the next week, when we were doing the show, it's packed. <laughs> And, and it's packed with people like 
uh, Jay Preston Allen and and Mike Nichols, Joe Papp, um, and and Alan Carr, the Hollywood producer, who was so in love with it, he wanted to move it to Las Vegas. So, <laughs> so it's just crazy. Where so, you get the dinner? <laughs> But I have a little uh, clip from it. Um, uh, now, back th then, the, vi the videos you see, the, the, when back then, the cameras were like little Volkswagens that you had to carry around. And so uh, this is a clip. This is the finale that, uh, with Joan Rivers and company. Oops, come over here. So this was sort of the original drag race. Yes, in a way. I mean, the chorus was kind of amazing. As uh, Holly Woodlawn was in it, Karen Bahari, Zora Rasmussen, Cherry Vanilla. It was kind of fabulous. It was all women in drag. Women in drag, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I was obsessed with so many of those people. Zora Rasmussen is one of my favorite entertainers. <laughs> She's so witty, and Karen Bahari is another one of my favorites. To me, she was like Betty Hutton with an edge. With a rock and roll edge, and Karen was one of the stars of Livin' Dolls. Yes, yes. Tell yes. us about that one. Um, so, so we decided that we needed an original uh, musical. I mean, we couldn't turn out this product fast enough. So we, uh, <laughs> I, I think we actually took acid, right? Yes. Yeah, I think. <laughs> with <Once>. Mike Nichols. <laughs> Scott walked in uh, to our loft on Renwick right. Street, and he, they just put out this big blue coffee table book of Barbie's fashions. And he said, this is a musical. So we 
took care of Sid and that weekend, and we wrote pretty much the whole musical that weekend. Uh, as <laughs> this was done with approval by Mattel. This well, was, we didn't ask. We didn't, we didn't, <laughs> Mattel. So this is what a calendar looked like at Club 57. So you can see we're very ambitious here. We did Boeing, Boeing, Boeing twice a night on um, on Mondays. Live in Dolls was Tuesday, uh, Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays. Then the Andy Reese did the Bad Seed on Wednesdays. I mean, it was a lot of stuff. And then there's Edith had his dead one night showing. That was uh, what this a is the same schedule as Joe's Pub. <laughs> So, so we wrote this uh, a musical about Barbie and Ken. And, yeah, so let's um, not obsess too much about the No, ads. that was the flyer. We actually wrote a musical. Yeah, and that was, um, that was the flyer that Andy Reese did. Um, uh, Billy Gallo who did, was, uh, did this most incredible sets that night, as did Timothy Dunleavy, who, who had done a Barbie fashion show. And uh, of course, Manny Parrish recorded the music, and, the, and Baba, the great Baba, did the hair. So that's Tracy. She played. Uh, she played uh, Fifi, who was uh, Barbie's, Barbie's poodle. <laughs> and there's uh, Karen Bahari, Donna Destry, and Zora Rasmussen as Barbie, uh, Midge, Midge, and uh, Chatty Kathy. And uh, and here's Barbie and Ken when they met. Jim Rich. Jim Rich. Rich. Okay. Oh, let's bring on the song. Yeah. So um, uh, Donna Destry originated this song 35 years ago, but Andy Golden's been singing it for 35 years. <laughs> so we'd like to bring her out to, to share. Thirty-five years for 35 years. <laughs> hello, hello. G.I. Joe. I love him so And I'll be true I'll wait for you Gee, I love my G.I. Joe And gee, I want the world to know Other boys may ask me out Joe, he's the one I'm dreaming about Though I sit home on Saturday to say I hear sort of a foreshadowing of hairspray there? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not, I don't think it would be uh, a mistake to Mama, say Mama, I'm a big girl now. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. And Mark, Mark, didn't you say something about 
how Club 57 enabled you to do sort of a Hairspray type <laughs> show and then you got to do hair, Hairspray? Yeah, well, I mean, when Hairspray uh, opened on Broadway, um, everyone who was still with us, uh, who was at Club 57, all agreed to say, my God, it's like a Club 57 show with a budget. <laughs> and I guess um, it's a good enough time to mention how all these names... Oh, no, not yet? Okay. Um, uh, and th that, around that time, I, I had decided that, Chris, that, uh, that we needed a Christmas show at, uh, at, at Club 57. And I asked Holly Woodlawn, would you be interested in playing Maria in The Sound of Music? So, and she said, are you kidding, darling? So um, I, then I said, well, we need a bigger cast. And, and so I, I enlisted almost every member of Club 57 at that time to be, uh, they played two parts because we realized that the children and the nuns were never sort of in the same scene. So, and also that Captain Von Trapp and Mother Abbess were never in the same scene. So uh, J.P. Doherty was a fabulous actor. Uh, he played both Captain Von Trapp and Mother Abbess. And, Brilliantly. And Michael was in it. I, there's a, I bet half the cast is probably here, the living ones are here tonight. And. Um, uh, I sucked in three roles. <laughs> <laughs> you were Sister Sledge, right? Wasn't that your name? Yeah, yeah. and I was yeah. a Von Trapp, and I was Diana Von Ross. Oh. So it was called... Um, <laughs> um, beca oh, no. <laughs> because the, the club was so small, that, um, and, and so we, we had the, the, the Abbey was on one end of it, and the, and the Von Trapp house was at the other, and then I, Vicky Schrott painted the Alps on the walls on the, in between. So the audience, sat in, the audience sat in the middle, and, and when a scene change came, I would yell, rotate, and the whole audience would stand up and turn their seats around. It's like sleep no more, long before sleep no more. This Immersive. Was, yes, so it was called um, uh, The Sound of Muzak, or Keep Your Von Trapps Shut. And it had a memorable tune in it. Well, we, we basically did The Sound of Music illegally, exactly as written. The only lyrics we changed, I think, at all were keys, because JP sang Mother Abbas is in that key, but uh, we did change a few lyrics like, uh, <laughs> Cocaine that stays on my nose and false lashes Silver white winters that melt into spring These are a few of my favorites, Miss Thing and then also, um, uh, when the dog bites, when my pee stings, when I'm feeling. But other than that, it was exactly. It was written, a smash. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and uh, I will say, it was a reinvention. It was the rethinking. <laughs> I, it was the funnest night. I mean, we did it many times. Uh, well, not so many. Times, but that was the funnest night I've ever had in my entire life. <laughs> and when we got home, I got home, uh, and we would always watch Mary Tyler Moore was on two or three times in the middle of the night. But our friend Marge just called, and we sat on the phone, and we talked about the show longer than it actually took to put on the show, just laughing and laughing. So that, that is my big memory of Club 57, really, is just the endless laughter. And of course, when you think of who would be the new Julie Andrews, Holly Woodlawn, you know, yeah. yeah. And Holly was fabulous at it. I remember, though, that uh, Alexis, this is also around the time I met the great Alexis DeLago as well. Um, <laughs> But let's, I, let, we should talk a second about, um, uh, back then, there was a guy you called, and his name was Nelson Sullivan. And you would, <laughs> Nelson was everywhere. Those videos you saw when you came in, those were all Nelson. He would just be backstage before anybody came, and he would just follow anyone. It's the essence of a sort of a cinema verite. But um, the more he drank, the more wobbly the camera got. <laughs> um, but uh, um, be before all these shows, because now the casts were getting bigger, and then um, Ru the Rudolph at uh, Danceteria um, said, why don't you come uh, do one, do shows here? And the first one I did was uh, the um, Sweet Bird of Youth that you were in with Alexa. At Danceteria. At Danceteria. Yeah. Um, but, um, and John Sex. And John Sex, the great John Sex. But we'll talk more about John Sex. So anyway, um, the, I did um, 
I did uh, Peter Pan, and then I did, uh, we did, I mean to say all the time, but uh, uh, we did. Uh, a, a I'm going to interrupt to say, you could say I, because if it's not clear, <laughs> Scott's brain and heart and soul was on fire with such creativity and just. And we didn't have flowing, a dime. Flowing and flowing. We didn't have a dime. Well, you had money. I was the only one. <laughs> I, I, my, my showbiz career had started, so uh, I paid for many. Uh, whatever. Well, most of the time you, we've spent were actually Nothing's at, changed. at the Xerox store. <laughs> most of the time is at the Xerox yeah. store. Um, but Nelson was ubiquitous. He'd be everywhere. So, uh, but be, prior to the show starting, I would have sometimes maybe 40 or 50 people in the show, and I'd have to get them all in one room and explain the night. It was kind of like Vince Lombardi. So um, I have a clip of, uh, from that time of me explaining the, this, this huge show that had Craig Mannenberg and Holly Woodlawn and Alexis and, and a lot of, lot of people in it. This is me explaining the play-by-play -play of it before the show. So this is the first clip, Steve. No. Look at my pants. Okay? After that, 
um, shirts during, when? during we do some shirt. of these days there's an instrumental break that's like a strip tease I want all the guys to take your t-shirts off all right <laughs> yes it used to be just that easy <laughs> We take our tops off, all right? <laughs> Tracy's going to introduce JP. All the guys stay on stage. We do say magnifique. Girls, it's got to be really bright. It has to be like when, when JP goes, uh, ooh la la la. I want to hear it really out. Ooh la la la. Let's do it once. JP, just do it for me. Ooh la la la. Ooh la la la. That's it. <laughs> It's got to be real bright and bouncy. Bright and bouncy, okay. bright and bouncy. She's going to say, it's time for the can-can. We do the can-can number. And then Tracy will introduce Alexis. Alexis will come out on I Love Paris. All right? Mark? Yes. And I Love Paris, you want to hear yeah. yeah. that? Wow. Listen, no, not yet. One more. Just for safekeeping, lightly hum the melody of the first verse of I Love Paris. <laughs> Very Vince Lombardi. <laughs> that was like that scene in Lady Bird. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there were a lot of. I like to throw in a contemporary yeah, reference yeah. now and then. Uh, there were a lot of muses back then who were who were, um, who were very uh, important to us, and um, that was that's the great John Sex. <clears throat> John and, and probably my whole life, John was the most uh, gentle and generous performer I, I ever knew or worked with. Um, that's the great Alexis Delago who who made all these costumes. She would make every costume for. She everybody. scared the shit out of me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, that's April took that great photograph. Um, that's the good John. Joey this is the cowboy show. Uh, there's Alexis as Tinkerbell. Um, uh, John we, Sex did kind of a Las Vegas parody act with his shellacked hair. He was <laughs> enchanting. I loved him. Um, do you want clips or more talking? <laughs> what do you want? You, you know, look, we okay. have a clip from Nude uh, here, Faces. This is from Nude Faces of 1985. This is, uh, this is the great Craig Vandenberg. 1985. Oh, this is the show we were just explaining. The show I was just telling everybody what to do. And look how well they're doing. Bill Anderson.
Now get this boy here, train him, bro. Okay. Who do you think you're kidding, huh? You won't fool anybody, right? Um, he was an incredible, incredible performer. Um, the budget's and got... Uh, go ahead. Mark, you little devil, sticking in the Close Encounters <laughs> theme. Yeah, but, but why? <laughs> so cute. Um, uh, the, 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 I, the amazing thing back then was that no one got paid. 
So uh, I, the only way that the currency of, was, of the time was drink tickets. So I would be stuffed to the gills with drink tickets. I would be passing them out all night. That's all anyone did any of the shows for. Um, the shows got really big. In fact, that I, the, one of the last big ones that we did was called, it was called Pagan Place. And uh, it was the Bible in 20 minutes. <laughs> and that was it. It had about 200 people in it. And in the middle of it, there used to be a gay, um, a gay a jogging or running group. They were called the Front Runners. And there were about two, uh, 150 of them. And I asked, would you run through the set with just your you know, little jogging pants on? They said, sure. So um, they ran through in the middle of this. And didn't Jerry Mitchell stage? Jerry Mitchell, who's here tonight, he staged this. Um, <laughs> This, but, was, this was actually like a typical night at Palladium. Yeah, but they built them. Um, they I had these steps built, but they built them too high. The the tread on them. So Alexis, who's on the top there in gold, um, had to crazy glue her shoes to her feet because she didn't want to fall off. She's still yeah. there. Can you believe there's no guardrail on any of this? And all these people are drunk. <laughs> because you paid them in drink tickets. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, then you had Ann it. Magnuson up on top as like I guess good, and uh, Joey Aris. Yes, as and Joey was the devil, devil, and that's Holly down here being sacrificed. And I believe I see a Lipsinka in the blue face taboo. There's a lot of your Tom Rubnitz. There's a lot of a lot of uh, great, great, great people. Um, there was one show uh, that we wrote at at, um, at Club Fifty Seven that was never recorded, never. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Never recorded and never um, and never. It was just it just went away when we did it. Well, that was the thing about all this stuff. Even though this video does exist, although you can see it's a little. I mean, I always feel like you had to be there. I mean, it's one thing to watch this on a video and you think, what are they talking about? But if you were there, you were there, and it was great. But uh, the, the the one thing I feel bad about the young generation is. They don't know from ephemeral. They don't know about the joy of doing things. Because we did these things just to have fun for that night, just to fill the schedule. And um, you say your main influences were, aside from classic musicals, Elvis and, and Margaret and Kitsch like that? Well, what for me, it was at the time, it was um, when I was seeing a lot of stuff that Jackie Curtis was doing and the Theater of the Ridiculous. And I used to go to these things, like with Andy Reese took me to Jack Smith, who was a great artist at that time. And he had these shows in his in a loft and only 10 people, it was his home, but only, and only 10 people could see them at a time. And I mean, it was a lot of, of amazing stuff, this sort of, and it was also kind of the beginning of glitter rock. I mean, it was a lot of influences coming out. Were you aiming for just a fun, kitschy, good time, or were you trying to make some larger statement? No, I, I think it was a really about fun. A good time. I really time. think it was about a good time. And yet, even though they were, everyone was insane, the, the joy of it, there's nothing like a dame, still came through in that number, despite the fact that people didn't know what the fuck they were yeah. doing. But uh, it, I looked like still I knew what I was doing. Yeah. You looked like you knew what you were doing. Yeah, I know. I'm but kidding. it was great fun, like Scott Covert and Peter Pan. Uh, he stole... He went to a laundromat in the Lower East Side and took everyone's clothes out of the dryer when they weren't looking. So that was the costume. <laughs> and, <laughs> I mean, it was just great, great, great fun. And, and at this show, at this show, I was in the DJ booth with Dolly Parton and Jack Nicholson. And they said, Dolly Parton said this, she said, this looks like something I ate once. And mean, meanwhile, back at Club 57 days, Scott would be clearing out the basement for it to be backstage. I would say something. He, I would make my running joke was there. Tell Keith to get these paintings out of here. He's throwing Keith <laughs> Haring <laughs> sketches in, in the garbage. Get out. We'd all be rich. If you had just walked home with one of them, you wouldn't have to write hairspray. <laughs> anyway. Um, so there was one show that we wrote because um, I wanted to bring back the, the uh, rotate concept and so and our dear friend Laura Kenyon she was starring in a nine on Broadway at the time so she only had one night off a week and we wrote we said let's write a musical and we called it Trilogy of Terror and that was the flyer um, 
basically what it was was it was three one-act musicals uh, all things that we love um, uh, one was about twins who hated each other uh, the other one was about a singer who rose to the top and then you know had a tragic end and then the last one was about the Scarsdale diet doctor and Jean Harris <laughs> So um, we did this in uh, Rotativision <laughs> at the theater. And um, so it was never, uh, never recorded. And, uh, and, the, and only, the other cast members was Vicki Schrott, Schrott as, as the nurse. Vicki Schrott, the great Vicki Schrott as a nurse. And um, Cameron Johan, who was nine at the time, he played the young boy. He played well, no, all the love interests. No, not young. He played all the, the men. adult he men. Played the, the, yeah, I'm saying he was young at the time, but he played her lover. And so, uh, and anyway. we were so cruel that we wanted. Um, Laura's had her back to the audience while they all came in, and she, there were also like uh, like hefty bags around. We can her, shut just the curtain creating during this. A, a look, and we would make poor Cameron get in a hefty bag an hour before the show, just so that he could make an entrance. Yeah, he's he's still not the same. <laughs> but um, anyway, this show was not recorded, so we thought as a, a treat tonight. Uh, we do the first act of it, which is uh, a short little piece, um, and it's the tale of uh, two little girls. And um, I'm going to ask you all, I think she's, is to rotate. <laughs> <laughs> And welcome to my trilogy of terror! <laughs> Take a walk. Let us walk down Nightmare Alley and swim in a river of blood and dance and ride on a carousel. That won't stop. Let us see the Encyclopedia of Fear. Torment, Tommy Toon, Trojan Women, Trombley to the end, Twins. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I like that. Twins. Two people born of the same mother before a few crucial minutes apart. Look alikes, sound alikes, think alikes, and most important of all, dress alikes. Two people so entwined that nothing can come between them. Or can it? Tonight, our story is the tale of two little girls. Oh, I think I can hear them now. <laughs> Finishing their opening number in the basement of Club 57. Or is it? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the sexy, sexy sounds of Mr. Rico, Rico!
it's going to be a very competitive evening tonight, Rico. <laughs> and we are the Happy Steel Twins. <laughs> you want a terror? <laughs> you want a terror? Let's all have it together. Lessons been learned in love. You thought that I thought that you were worth thinking of. I remember that fight, caught in that fight, slept on a Chinatown. Were you right? We were wrong. We were stringing along, and now it seems our role is turning upside down. Hey, the tables have turned. A lessons been learned in love. What I'm speaking of Had my fill of affairs Now I'm through splitting hairs The tables are turning so fast It's like we're playing musical chair And oh, what a lovely lesson In love Push your chair back Fold your napkin Don't look so confused Maybe this was bound to happen Sweetheart, you've just been for the diamond earrings, Rico. No problem, baby. Just see you later. All right. <laughs> I'll plant you now and I'll dig you later. <laughs> diamond earrings? Yeah. <laughs> Rico. We're going to go out dancing tonight, and I'm going to wear them, and we're going to do the cha-cha-cha. Oh, I'm so exhausted. What a great show. But you know, I thought the audience was sitting on its hands. You were really great, Cindy. Hey, you know what? I got a great number for us to do in our opening night of Detroit. I started making the costume and everything. But you know, I'm wondering, do you think Rico can have an arrangement for us in two days? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. But you better tell him to make it a solo and not a duet. Why? Why? Because I'm leaving the act. I'm leaving you in this stinking act. I'm not going to Detroit or any other two-bit town. I'm moving on to New York, New York. Where? New York, New York, New York. Shh. Yeah, that's right, baby. New York. I've had it with 
free bags and rat traps and blue plate specials. I've had it with twin beds, twin cities, and twin donuts. <laughs> It's separate checks from now on, doll. This freak show act of ours is getting on my nerves. <laughs> and I'm getting out. When? When? When the big hand is on the 12, and my left hand is resting on that hat box handle. But why? Because questions, questions, questions. I don't need anybody. I don't need you. I don't need anybody, not the stinking act, except maybe a good saxophonia player. Who? Rico, 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 Rico! <laughs> yeah, shut up! Rico, that's right. I'm leaving with your boyfriend, Rico Bravo. Jealous? Rico? Yeah, Rico. <laughs> But Rico doesn't love you, and he never will. Who's talking about love? I just want to get out of here alive! Hmm. Listen, duh. You were born two and a half minutes too late, and you'll never catch up to me. All my life, you've tried to control me, and I've always let you. Isn't that enough for you, Cindy? <laughs> please, I'll do anything to make you stay. Please, please. Ew. <laughs> ah, ugh, God. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's something you can do for me. You can stop your namby pamby crying and get up off your knees, half brain. Please. You shut up and let me pack! That's what mother used to say. <laughs> Two little girls who were always dressed up just the same came to life. Twenty years later, and it seems like nothing has changed. Changed for life. Keeping the past in that secret place. Nothing to hide anymore. Matching communion dress trimmed with lace. Never 
each other Now love has asked one to go Take a heart away Does the other know What my heart can't say That we're changed for life. I don't think you'll be going anywhere, Cindy. Oh, you! <laughs> You don't have the nerve. Oh, I don't, huh? Watch me. Watch me. No, 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 no. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. I hate us. I hate mother. I hate Laura Kenya! Laura Kenya! my ex-husbands for bringing me here tonight. Thank you so much. Love you. And we'd like to thank Michael Mustang for the part of the Thank you, God. Um, Is this one's on? Okay. Ah! Okay. Um, the 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 um, the sort of the bittersweet or sad part of tonight. The tragic. The tragic part of tonight is, is that there's so many people who were part of all these. First of all, I'd like to say anyone who was ever in one of the shows, stand up. <laughs> yeah. <Hey! laughs> <laughs> you are all so fantastic. Wait, we have to say and Ron and Sophie. Right. All right, sit down. <laughs> and I want to thank uh, everyone at the museum here, especially uh, the incredible staff here and, and Ron and Sophie, who, who have put this entire exhibition on. And, and also, I want to thank John Emerson, who really was the, the sort of the, the snowball of this. He, it was his idea to do a, a series of movies um, of, that we used to show at Club 57, and John wanted to do that as a film series here. And then that turned into this incredible exhibit. If you, if you, must, if you haven't seen it, it's really, really touching. Um, the tragic part of it is that so many people who were part of that are, aren't here anymore. Um, Part of the reason it all ended was because people were dying. 
Um, when when hairspray opened on uh, when, when, on the first, I think dress. No, the, well, opening night. Yeah. It was one of the most distinct memories I'll ever have. Was on this joyous night, just. Uh, We made a curtain speech, and I just said, I wish that balcony went, sorry, I wish that balcony went straight to heaven, so it would be filled, Andy Reese and William and John Lively Sachs, and all Johnson. These, and all these people that were part of those, these nights. Um, and what's wonderful about Downstairs is that they're so celebrated. And um, uh, uh, all, the, all the incredible artwork that these people, Vicki Schrott and Andy Reese and, and John Sex and, and all, all of them that were, were such a, a vibrant part and amazing to think of a world where if they had lived, um, what they'd be doing now. Um, um, we'd like to, to finish up with just a, a, a little song. We used to have a, a, a joke among all of us back then. We call our, ourselves the Who family. Because you would go like, well, I'm Scott Whitman. You go, Scott who? Like, who cared? <laughs> so um, this is sort of a, a little Who family song. Though I know we don't share a name, I still love you just the same. So we don't share a front door key. It doesn't mean that I don't care. And I know you're always there for me. So take my hand, show me how. Cause I'm only learning now what makes a family. What makes a family? Thank you, Moma, and good night. <laughs>